Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to our worship service this morning as we celebrate Christmas in July, or more accurately, the Feast of the Nativity in July. One change in our worship, and that will be that I will not be using the prayer today that is printed under today's reading insert. I will be using one of the prayers for the celebration of the Feast of the Nativity, uh, so you will not be able to, to follow or read along. Prayer with me, but uh, we'll be able to follow the first two lessons with your answer. We give a special welcome to our visitors. If you're new in the Springfield, Clark County area, or looking for a new church home, we invite you to make sure you've got your new church home. And now I invite you to turn to page 94 in the front of the worship book as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship with the order of confession and forgiveness. And by those who came without difficulty, to please stay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, plan the thoughts of our hearts bent by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you and fought word in thee by what we have done and by our we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us and for his sake. God forgives us all our sins. As a call ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We now begin our celebration with angels we have heard on high, hymn number 289, on the back of your week. Welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church. You're watching us on YouTube. We're at the corner of Wittenberg and Columbia. We invite you to come worship with us any Sunday. This is an old French carol. The verses are hundreds of years old, and the chorus is written by God in the Bible. Glory to God in the highest. This is what the angels sang to the shepherds. This is the chorus of this. We are now celebrating Christmas in July. We have brought food for the poor. This is our tradition, and this is a Christmas hymn. We're singing an ancient French carol. The verses written by French poets, the chorus is what's in, from the Bible that the angels sang to the shepherds. Glory to God in the highest.
the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Sixth Sunday after Pentecost, our reader is Phyllis Johnson. Psalm 86 responsively.
flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If in fact we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God, for the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruit of the Spirit grow inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Our pastor is Pastor John Pollock. He'll now be reading the gospel. He's walking up and down the steps of the pulpit, and he'll read the gospel. We're singing the Alleluia.
Sunday, immediately following this 1030 service. Special music by Joe Brewer.
atoning death upon the cross pays the debt of sin that we owe. They do not believe that on that third day he rose again from the dead, giving us victory over sin, death, and the power of the devil. But they will celebrate this secular Christmas. Rudolph the Red Nose Reindeer, Frost of the Snowman, the Grinch, Santa Claus, and all those other things that have come about with a secular Christmas. My baby sister was in college. She dated a Jewish fellow. And even though his family went to synagogue, and even though they observed Hanukkah, they had a Christmas tree. And then when the rabbi would come over, they'd throw a blanket over it so he wouldn't see it. But they just liked secular Christmas, and so they would celebrate. So this is why in July we take time to celebrate the festival of nativity without all the trappings, without all the confusion, without all the hoopla of a secular Christmas as well as a theological Christmas that takes place December 24th and 25th. Also, this festival in the ancient church was often referred to as the festival of the incarnation. The word incarnation meaning God taking on human flesh and coming to the world. No other religion in the world has such an event. All the other religions of the world have stories of their god or goddesses or both coming down from Mount Olympus or paradise or whatever and mingling with humans for a little bit, but still as a god or goddess and then going back up to Mount Olympus or paradise or wherever it is they came from. But only in Christianity do we have this awesome event of God loving us so much that he takes on him to be among us, to experience exactly what we experience, to grieve like we grieve, to suffer like we suffer, to rejoice like we rejoice, to celebrate like we celebrate, to have that total human experience. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth, and we have beheld His glory, glory as the only Son from the Father. That's what the Incarnation is all about. That is why it's important that we do not lose sight of what the Feast of the Nativity is all about instead of becoming confused with all the secular influences that cause us to lose focus of what God was really doing. And so as we celebrate this Feast of the Nativity, we turn back to St. Luke's account of that birth of Jesus Christ. And we focus on the seventh verse which again reads, And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. I want you to underline, if you have your own Bible, to underline or highlight. If you don't have your own Bible, then write it on the bulletin, your bulletin, there was no room for them in the inn. Was that a little phrase? packed with all kinds of important information for us to understand what the nativity of our Lord was all about. The first thing, that there was no room for them in the end tells us, is that we are not to limit God by our expectations. At the time Jesus was born, the Jews were longing for the Messiah. And over the years, they had forgotten the truth about the Messiah. They had forgotten what Isaiah had written about the suffering servant. They forgot about what Jer Jeremiah had complained about the one who would come to save the world and would take the problems of the world upon his shoulder. They forgot what the psalmist had written about the coming Messiah. All they focused on was the fact that he was to be a descendant of David. And to them, that meant if he was a descendant of David, it had to be he was going to be a warrior king like David. And he would come with all this power and with all this might from God above. And he would drive the Romans into the sea and reestablish the grandeur of Israel. And that Israel would be the most important nation in the Mediterranean. And all other nations would have to bow before them. They believed that when the Messiah came, he would be born in a palace. He would be born in luxury. He would be born among the wealthy. He would have the best of everything. That was their expectation. And so they were limiting God. They were saying, God sent the Messiah. This is where he will be. And the reality is, as we 
we live in this 21st century as followers of Jesus Christ, we also have that habit of sometimes limiting the power of God because of our expectation. Because of what we think God should do or shouldn't do. Because of our prejudice or our agendas, we limit God. Yet there is no room in it tells us that God goes and acts beyond our expectation. It was God's purpose to send Jesus not in a palace, not born to someone of luxury and wealth, but to be born in a stable. And the reality is the stable was not like you often see portrayed on Christmas cards, nor was the stable like you often see in movies about Jesus up until recent times. Movies like Ben-Hur and King of Kings and Greatest Story Ever Told where the stable looks like some beautiful wooden structure and all this bright light and so forth. The reality is that the stable that Jesus was born in in Bethlehem was probably carved out of the limestone rock. It was nothing much more than a cave. It was dark. It was dirty. And it stank to high heaven. Because no matter how much you mucked out the stalls in that stable, because the animals being there 24-7, there constantly was that odor that animals give out when they are in, in door lodging. So why would Jesus send his only son into the world in a stable, in a dark, dirty stable? Instead of in a palace where everybody would celebrate his birth. Because God was sending a message to the birth of Jesus that he was coming into the dark and dirty world in which we live in order to bring us light and salvation. Because of sin, sin is staying the world. Remember the creation story of Jesus. As we read that creation story, Making Isaac think that Jacob is Esau, so he receives his blessing. 
So now Esau has been cheated out of his birthright. Yet it is Jacob that God uses to be the father of 12 sons who become the descendants of the 12 tribes of Israel. The youngest son, Joseph, despised by his brothers for being the father's favorite in his old age since he was the youngest, sell him off to slave traders and take him to Egypt. He becomes a servant in Egypt, falsely accused of trying to seduce Potiphar's wife, thrown in prison. God gets him the ability to interpret dreams. He interprets Pharaoh's dream, and he's elevated to a position of second in power to every, throughout all of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. He brings about the saving them of his family and many families in the promised land who are going through a drought of famine by having stored up plenty of food to share. And we go on and we look at uh, Moses, 80 years old, tending his father-in-law's sheep. God says, Moses, go down to Egypt. Tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. Moses says, God, you came to talk to me. I don't even speak well. I can't go before Pharaoh. Why? I'd start stuttering. I'd be so scared. Don't worry about it, Moses. I'm sending your brother Aaron. And he speaks like a bird sings. It's going to be a problem. Oh, but God, you, speak, you don't really want me to go. Yet it's Moses. At 80 years old, who God sends down to demand that Pharaoh release the Hebrew children. And then the Hebrew children end the promised land, and there's a series of judges. And some of the people that God chooses are a surprise. Samson, Gideon, Deborah. I mean, it was a total shock to the people that God would raise up a woman to be a judge who would defeat some of Israel's enemies. And then we have the first King Saul, a king from the smallest tribe of all of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin. And then a shepherd boy is made the second king of Israel. And you have to remember that when Jesus was born, shepherds by then were despised, yet their most favorite king was a shepherd boy. David the shepherd king. And on and on we go throughout the history of Jeremiah and Amos. So forth. And then you have Zechariah and Elizabeth, the, who become the parents of John the Baptist when they are way beyond childbearing years. So we cannot limit God with our expectation. We cannot limit God with our prejudices or with our agendas because God acts whenever and wherever He desires to act in the way that He chooses to act, which more often than not confounds human reason. His greatest act that can found us is the fact that he would send his only son into the world to save the world through his death upon the cross. And so no room in the end tells us that we do not limit God. But as Martin Luther said, quote, let God be God. End of quote. Let God be God. We serve God. Let God do what he wants. We follow. The second important lesson from there was no room in the end is that it confronts us with that question of is there room, any room in your heart for Jesus? Jesus couldn't find any room the night he was born. Not just the fact that there was no room in the end. But as he grew and began his public ministry, there wasn't much room in many people's hearts for Jesus. Many people despised him, rejected him, ridiculed him, thought he was crazy. So the question is for you. Do you have room in your heart for Jesus? I don't mean you believe in Jesus. Obviously you believe in Jesus or you wouldn't be here this morning. I'm not talking about just believing in Jesus Christ as Savior of the world. I'm not just talking about believing that Jesus Christ's death upon the cross pays the debt of sin that you owe, that on the third day he rose again from the dead to give his victory over death, and 40 days later he ascended into heaven. I'm talking about, and what the nativity of our Lord is asking is, do you have room in your heart to do Jesus' will? Not your will. Not your agenda. Not your prejudices. But do you have that Place in your heart, that place in your heart for Jesus 
and his desires. When St. Luke says there was no room in the end, that word that's translated as room is a Greek word that literally means to have no place. There's no place for you. Anywhere. It means to have no space. You have nowhere that you can be. It means to have no opportunity. You have no opportunity to do anything, to do what you want to do, or to go along with society. Nothing. It means you have no power. And it also means to have no inhabited place, whether a city, a town, a village, or a district in which to lay your head. You are totally without anything. So the nativity of our Lord has asked. Is there room today for Jesus? Still today, as then, Jesus often finds no place of welcome in this world, no soul willing to accept his leadership or to submit to his lordship because we're told to do our own thing. We're told that what we want is more important than anything else. We're told to look out for number one. We're told to have this very selfish attitude towards life. And yet Jesus comes along and says, says, do you have room? Do you have a place in your heart for me and to submit to my Lordship? Still today is then. Jesus often finds no space to call his own, but is driven out of every public place and many private places. Those of you my age are older. You remember that Jesus had space in our lives. We had Christmas pageants in school. We had manger scenes on the courthouse square. We had Good Friday off. We had Jesus mentioned constantly in public events with prayers before ball games and concerts and all kinds of other activities. But today, Jesus can find very little space because he's been closed out of so many places. Still today, as then, Jesus finds no opportunity to be shared with others as his church allows itself to be intimidated by loud voices which tell it religion or faith is a personal matter and do not share it with others. In exact opposition to what Jesus commanded, go therefore to all nations and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all I have commanded. The church. Here's these loud voices screaming about separation of church and state, which doesn't even appear in the First Amendment. The First Amendment says the government will not establish a church, a state church like they had in Europe, nor will it infringe upon the practice of one state. The term separation of church and state is from a letter of Thomas Jefferson. And those who use it to beat the church over the head do not understand the context in which Thomas Jefferson wrote those words. They just take that phrase out of context and say, see, church can't do anything. That's not what Thomas Jefferson was doing. Thomas Jefferson received a letter from a group of Baptist preachers in Danbury, Connecticut. For some reason, these preachers were afraid that the government was going to make them change, that they weren't going to allow them to be Baptists anymore. They were going to become Episcopalians or Lutherans or Roman Catholics. And so they write to Thomas Jefferson, as the third president of the United States, and say, you know, what can we do? And Thomas Jefferson writes back to tell them, the government can't force you to do anything. The government can't tell you how to worship. The government can't tell you what hymns to sing. The government can't tell you what festivals to observe or not observe. The, church, the government can't tell you how to dress. The government can't tell you how to build your churches. This is why there has been a wall of separation between church and state. And when you read the context of the letter, what Thomas Jefferson is assuring those Baptist preachers is that the, the wall of separation is for the protection of the church, not the protection of the government. It is to protect the church from the government interfering. Coming in here and telling us we have to change our religion. We have to change our uh, lessons each week. We have to change our hymnal. In some nations, that's done. The First Amendment guarantees you won't. But too many people in church are intimidated by these people who don't know what they're talking about when they talk about the separation of church and state. 
not realizing Jefferson wrote that term, saying it was to protect the church. And so too many church people are quiet, not giving Jesus an opportunity to reach those who are still in sin. Still in day is then, Jesus finds himself with no power in his followers as they allow earthly matters to squeeze out faith and the promises of Jesus. Too often when the church has a conflict, instead of getting down on its knees and praying, or when a church is faced with a problem, instead of getting down on our knees and praying and asking Jesus for guidance and direction, we turn to IBM, or we turn to Bill Gates, or we turn to Ford or GM to try to use some kind of secular model to solve the problems of the church. GM and Ford and Bill Gates and Microsoft and IBM, they're not institutions of faith. They're institutions of business. The church relies on Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. And yet Jesus finds himself oftentimes with no power as his followers do not get down on their knees and pray for a solution, but instead try to do it himself. Still today is him. Jesus finds no inhabited place to be welcomed as the way, the truth, and the life, and the Savior of the world. Instead, he finds hearts that are closed as tight as a door, with no interest in salvation. Yet Jesus continues to reach out. As it says in Revelation 3:20, quote, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and I will die with him. And he with me in the cold. Jesus never stops reaching out. Even though Jesus is rejected time and time again, he continues to reach out to those who have no room for them. And so we have asked, do we have room in our heart to do what Jesus wants us to do? To give him a place, to give him space, to give him power, to give him opportunity, to give him a place to inhabit so that he can save those who are lost. And condemned by their sin. The voice of Jesus today is a proclamation of the gospel, and we must continue to proclaim it in every village, every hamlet, every town, on every mountaintop, and every valley, at every sea, and every ocean, every lake, every pond, every creek, every sea, every isthmus, every island, so that people may hear that saving grace of Jesus Christ. There is no room in the end. But there must be room in your heart for the Lord Jesus if you want forgiveness, if you want peace, and if you want assurance of eternal life in the everlasting kingdom of our God. Is there room in your heart? Room to give to Jesus the place, the space, the opportunity, the power, and the inhabited places he needs in order to reach the entire world. When Jesus came, there was no room in the end and little room in people's hearts. The only place Jesus found room was on the cross. And the people were more than happy to give Jesus the room on that cross. Not realizing that by his going to the cross, his death paid the sacrifice of sin so that we might be his own and live under him in his kingdom. Jesus continues to search, even though he continues to be rejected. As followers of Jesus Christ, it is your responsibility to make room for Jesus so he may use you to reach those who are unchurched or unstable. Is there room in your heart to do the Master's will? To reach out to the insane so that they too may be numbered among the heirs to the kingdom? of which St. Paul spoke today in our second lesson. This is why the nativity of our Lord took place that first, what we call Christmas month, or Christmas morning. This is why it happened. So that there would be room in people's hearts to share his gospel with others. The reason for the nativity of our Lord was that all may have the path, that free and open path, to be children of the Heavenly Father. Amen.
peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us now sing Away in the Manger, hymn number 277. In the back of your Away in the Manger, it's called Luther's uh, Cradle Hymn. It was brought by the German Lutherans to the United States and published in a uh, hymn book in the 1800s in Cincinnati. The music is attributed to James Murray. It, there's controversy as to whether Luther really wrote this, but James Murray attributed it to Luther. And he is supposed to have sung it by the cradle of his son Hans, but uh, it was carried over from Germany to the United States by the German Lutherans.
and declare his glory among the nations. Gracious God, hear our prayer. God of glory, the heavens are glad, and the earth rejoices over the birth of your Son, and the seas roar, and the forest sings for joy. Move us to respond in loving care for all our creation. God, gracious, gracious God, God hear our prayer. God of counsel and might, grant your wisdom to all the leaders that they may serve in the name of justice and righteousness, and all may live in peace. Gracious God, hear our prayer. God of light, illumine the lives of those who walk in darkness of oppression, homelessness, poverty, and sickness. Give your yoke a burden and give them the rest from their weariness. Gracious God, hear our prayer. God of God, lead this congregation to receive with love those who enter our doors, especially those whom the world has no room. Gracious God, hear, hear our prayer. God of life, we give you thanks for all of the saints who have gone before us. And now sing a new song for you. Keep us faithful until the day that we join them in the brightness of your glory. Gracious God, hear, hear our prayer. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all of whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Baker is assisting our pastor and do not have the offering. The acolyte is uh, Harvey's grandson. This is Christmas in July. We're celebrating this is our tradition. We have been singing Christmas hymns and we have had the Christmas, Christmas, uh, had a Christmas sermon. We have food in front that's been brought for our pantry. We have a pantry ministry. We serve 8,000 meals a month about 200 a week hot meals at the Rangeway table. You're welcome to come and volunteer. Just call our church office, sign up as a volunteer. This is July the 20th, fifth Sunday after Pentecost. Now see the acolyte in front, you see the altar. Our altar is made of oak. All the, the wood in the front, the cross, the uh, statues and pulpit, everything is uh, solid oak beautiful altar representing the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Jesus on the cross. He's our Redeemer, incarnated by the and, uh, Holy Spirit. He is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ. This is the meaning of the altar and the scene in the front. Lift up your hearts. 
we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should all times and in all places give thanks and praise to Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us a way into everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth, and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their many name. This is the holy, holy, holy. We believe that the choirs of angels and those who are on earth and heaven are singing with us. We sing the holy, holy, holy.
a very holy time as we're now receiving the true body and true blood of Jesus Christ who died to save us from sin, who died on the cross and is giving us eternal life in his presence forever to eternity. Uh, him was in a collection compiled by John Wesley Work, first Negro uh, collector of songs. He was a professor at Fisk University, professor of Latin and Greek, and he wrote down the songs that the plantation singers had been singing, popularized them with the Jubilee singers from Nashville, Tennessee, throughout the United States, brought these this one spiritual and all the spirituals to us, John Wesley Work. St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio.
thank you for watching St. John's Service on YouTube. Tune in anytime uh, for our broadcast. We're happy to bring you this service. We have a Christian school. You can call the office to find information about that. Also, we have daycare. Thank you for joining us this Lord's Day and any day, any time you're watching on YouTube. I hope and I pray that God will continue to bless you and keep you this day in all your days. We will pray for you and continue to pray for our ministry.